the new Assassin's Creed game, I think it's called Syndicate, is coming out, I think, later this year. It's being set in Victorian-era England, right? So the 19th century, 1800s. And it really got me to thinking. I always thought that it would be good to have a like a Victorian era type of a uh, type of Assassin's Creed. That's sort of a Sherlock Holmes setting or like maybe a, a steampunk type setting. But the thing is that the historical settings that games can take place in just all seem to me to be really tired if you include all the different genres and all the types of games. You know, you have a lot of strategy games set in the set in the ancient world. Um, there was an Assassin's Creed set in the Renaissance, there was an Assassin's Creed set in the French Revolution, there was an Assassin's Creed set in the American Revolution. There was an Assassin's Creed set in the ancient uh, Middle East and uh, Syria and places like that. Um, pretty much every war um, has been done, not just in video games in general, almost every war has been done by the Total War series alone. You have those Roman battles, you have the Japanese wars with the samurai, you have the Napoleonic wars. We don't need to even talk about World War One and World War Two, which of course shooters have done to death. World War Two was done to death before anything else was. Vietnam, you had a Call of Duty set in Vietnam. I think there was even a Medal of Honor set in Vietnam. I might be mistaken. You have games set in modern day big cities. Obviously, Grand Theft Auto is the obvious example and all of its descendants. You have games set in the 1920s in America, which was an interesting period. It just seems to me like every interesting historical period and historical setting has been has been used. It's like there's no setting where you can put something where it's like, this is exciting. I've never experienced this before. Are you concerned specifically for the Assassin's Creed series? Or are you concerned in a broader way, like about all of video gaming? No, well, I mean all of video gaming in general. Like Assassin's Creed 2, which is my favorite Assassin's Creed, that game was set in Renaissance Italy, which was fascinating. It had tons of historical information in it. It was actually as educational, really, as it was fun. And it was exciting to be in that world. It was exciting to be invested in that time period and to see, uh, you know, Machiavelli and Da Vinci and all these people that were hanging around at that time and to go to all these historical places and the Vatican City and Rome and Florence and all of these places and it's just like it's it just seems to me that that was that was an excellent decision by them I th- that was an excellent decision by Ubisoft to use that as a setting but where do you go from here is there any setting that would be fresh enough that w- it would excite me like playing that game excited me that's that's the question I guess I had a very definite disagreement with you when we first uh, discussed you know when you first brought up this idea that we were running out of historical periods I do somewhat see your point a little more now. It seems as though historical periods often end up tied to certain genres of video games. Uh, So, for example, yes, Rome has been covered to death by real-time strategy games, but how many first-person hack-and-slash games or third-person hack-and-slash games have taken place in Rome? Have, you know, how have we done any kind of game where you're a... uh, uh, a legionary in the middle of the Peloponnesian War, or something like that. Yeah, I I, I hear that, and and it's true that 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 variation has helped uh, in the past. I don't know if you've ever played um, um, Company of Heroes, but Company of Heroes was an extremely highly critically acclaimed sort of real time squad based strategy game that was set in World War II, and it actually made everything feel completely fresh again because obviously first person shooters had completely depleted uh, that setting. Um, but by doing it with a strategy game, they sort of revived it. I wouldn't say that I was excited to be fighting uh, Nazis again in World War II, and I can't claim that I was really excited to be doing that um, even in... Uh, the last time I was probably excited to do that was maybe Return to Castle Wolfenstein or the first <laughs> two Call of Duties, which was years and years ago. Um, but it definitely was fresh. I'll give it that. It was a new thing. I don't know if the setting made the game. I think the game had really good, solid mechanics, and that's what made it good. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I hear what you're saying. There's there's switching up the type of games with the with the settings. I mean, it's legitimate to me that newer games, if they want to get us excited about settings, might just have to be fantasy or uh, futuristic uh, settings. And I'm, I'm kind of cool with that. Although the truth is that, that those can get repetitive as well if you don't have a creative company and a good uh, design staff. Certainly, if we want to go into fantastical types of worlds, there is an endless amount of interesting, cool shit that could happen. But I want to stick with his- historical environments, because I still think you're wrong. Uh, I think even if you don't mix things up... Okay, let's talk about World War One, because you mentioned it as being tired. I can think of a single game that I know of that takes place in World War One, and it was a small indie game that was about toy soldiers. Um, I'm pretty... I'm not 100% sure... 
I think there was a Medal of Honor set in World War One uh, back in the day. I'm not 100 percent sure of that. Um, there's also This War of Mine, um, which is also set in World War Wait, One. Wait, is not it? Mistaken, though I haven't I haven't played it. I had the impression that game was about a post-apocalypse. Hmm. Well, similar enough. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I think it's about I think it's about World War One, if I'm not mistaken. I I have not played it. But you're right that if you were going to go for one of the world wars, that would definitely be the less tired to uh, to go. In for. fairness to developers, though, World War One is a boring war. It is not interesting. <laughs> With the trench, the trench warfare. Well, there's different ways that you could do it. It wouldn't have to be a shooter necessarily. I agree that for a shooter, I don't know if it would work. And you could do a lot of different things. That I mean. Uh, how many World War II games are at all historically accurate to the way that World War II was fought? There, at no point was there ever the lone soldier charging in somewhere and uh, taking down the entire enemy force. So it makes as much sense in World War I as it made in World War II. Okay, true enough. All right. I don't know if, if shooters are really um, are really the, the uh, <laughs> best uh, vehicle for historical accuracy. In Assassin's Creed, it, it could work a lot better just uh, game design-wise, you know. In the game, you're already supposed to be only viewing a simulation anyway, so it makes sense that there would be commentaries and different things to read about the different things you would see, you would be seeing, and different things like that. And since it was much more of a slowly walk around, stalk your prey kind of game, there would be time to read those things, listen to those things, pay attention to the details. You know, when I'm storming through Carrington and Call of Duty, I don't exactly have time to stop. And oh my goodness, they, the 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 French provincial architecture sure is accurate here. Um, <laughs> as I before I before I napalm it, you know. Um, also, you're right. This this war of mine is not set in World War One. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I stand corrected. Awesome. I like being right. It's all, I don't know if it's set in a post-apocalypse, but yeah, okay, we'll let that one slide. You know what? You're right. <laughs> uh, ancient, ancient history. Uh, I feel like ancient history in all aspects of our, our culture is massively underappreciated, which is understandable to some extent because we know very little about it. So it is difficult to really craft a narrative. The reason that it's so easy to craft a narrative about Rome is because so much literature and uh, uh, about the contemporary accounts survived, but Rome is kind of an anachronism in that way. Uh, whereas the Neo-Assyrian Empire has next to no information about it. But how fucking cool would it be to play a game where you were, you know, the in the army of Sargon of Akkad and running around with your stone hammer, creating the first empire? <laughs> Okay, I hear what you're saying. I mean, that that itself is almost like a catch-22, though, because then it almost becomes more like a fantasy setting, seeing as there is no, there isn't as much historical information. People want to play in in Rome. They want to see what it was like. It has an allure to it because it's the foundation of our culture, and we have so much literature from there, and there's so much um, there's so much richness to that world, and that I think that interests people that holds a certain uh, a certain but we amount do, of, it's uh, not like we know nothing magic about, to uh, more ancient cultures it's certainly uh, sargon of akkad we know very very little but we know a ton about egypt i can't think of really a single game aside from maybe some strategy city builder type games and maybe and of course age of empires one but aside from uh, those few exceptions i can't think of any game that really plays with egypt as a setting at all that's true and we do know a lot about egypt yep. we know a shit ton about egypt it's uh it's true that's a good point all right next assassin's creed set in egypt ubisoft take note <laughs> an assassin's creed set in egypt would actually be kind of phenomenal that could actually because you you might recall i was super interested in Assassin's Creed before the first game came out. Yes, that's and right. And then immediately completely lost interest. It was the most never obsessed. Even played the first one. <laughs> it was it was the most obsessed anyone could possibly be, only over a game trailer to the exclusion of the game. <laughs> I, as I recall, I, I had uh, forum uh, avatars and banners for myself that were completely set up around that main character because I was such a fan of stealth games. And when when the first Assassin's Creed was coming up, I'd played pretty much everything. The Tenchu series had gone way downhill. I'd played every Metal Gear Solid game that had come out. I'd played every Hitman game that had come out. I was excited for a new uh, franchise that was focused on stealth. 
And particularly, I thought the history surrounding it was so cool, and then it, I completely lost interest. I have never completed a single Assassin's Creed game. What happened? Uh, a big part of what happened is that I got poor. Oh. I couldn't really afford the first game when it came out. By the time I could afford games again, I think the fourth one was being talked about. But even when I could afford games, you know, I, I purchased the first one on Steam sale, and was utterly disappointed in it. I thought it was boring as balls. Okay, this is like Mass Effect. I bet everyone that you've told this to tells you that you have to play the second one. Skip the first one. Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think so. You might be the first one well, to say let that. let me be the first to say that. You want the second one. The second one was the peak, and I thought it was quite spectacular. And then everything was downhill from there. Did you play it on PC at all? I did play it on PC. I only played it on PC, in fact. How are the controls because they were god-awful on the PC port of the first game. Um, I think the, in the second game, I recall them being pretty good. I mean, I don't uh, remember anything about them in particular. I'm definitely not one of these people that is shocked that anyone can control anything with a mouse and keyboard. Oh my goodness, don't get me started. Oh, well, those people are just stupid people. Aside from, like, maybe hair gel and completely round glasses, it's maybe the easiest way of spotting, at a distance, those people. (laughs) All right. Um, Returning to historical video game settings, the culmination of my point that I've been very awkwardly approaching is that we've done a lot of video games that are vague in their historical setting. There's a lot of medieval game well of course the medieval period right. is hundreds right. of years medieval games, and yes. medieval gets rolled into uh early modern it, it, have you ever played an early modern game i i can't think right. of one a game that's actually called that's called early modern right now that's not that's not a thing a uh, a game set during the English Civil War, for example, which you know that's some exciting shit right there, ball and powder rifles and the uh, and that sort of thing. Right. Have you seen? Um, I think I asked you this before, but have you seen uh, Rick and Morty? Yeah, Dan Harmon, man. Oh, that's true. It is Dan Harmon. Rick, Rick and Morty's so good. I hear the second season's out or beginning to get out. I have to go look that up. Yeah, I uh, I haven't watched it yet because uh, I don't have a TV. I I, I don't necessarily want to steal it. Mm-hmm. At least not right away. Maybe I'll steal it and then buy the DVDs. Mm-hmm. That's that's what I did with Game of Thrones for a while. I see. Is Dan Harmon, I, I want to financially let people know that I like him. But right. at the same time, I don't want to do that enough to buy a TV and the network set up. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't want to declare your love for six, six third parties yeah, exactly. at the same time. I, I, I will buy the DVDs. <laughs> Have you ever mm-hmm. actually watched the original original rick and morty it's like a flash video no because uh all right so i don't recall how long ago but justin roiland the guy who co-created rick and morty with dan Harmon alone made a rick and morty short you can still go online and find it i highly recommend it so that you can see how positive dan Harmon's influence is positive artistically or positive like because Rick and Morty is, is already a terribly cynical show in a very funny way, but I mean, it's an incredibly cynical show. So is that what you mean by positive? Or you mean it was positive artistically? Positive artistically, for sure. Uh, I see. Um, when Justin Roiland made the show by himself, it is literally just dick jokes. That is, That's that is hilarious. the entire thing. It is, Morty, we, uh, Morty, we, we gotta go back in time, Morty. You, you gotta suck my dick. It's the only way for it to work, Morty. Oh my goodness, that's so much worse than what it is. Yeah. That Dan Harmon bit is a great segment into a discussion about community. It all fits together. (laughs) So I obviously am a huge community fan. I know the whole show backwards and forwards. Right. So why don't you give me some context to work in? What, What is your experience with the show? What do you think about it? When did it like get canceled and, and what's his name, uh, left the show? That could probably work for every season after three. (laughs) So I think I watched through season three then. Um, I think it's just absolutely fantastic. It's, I have to, the thing that strikes, that strikes me most about community is that the window of the humor that the humor strikes is a, is something that nothing else strikes. It's funny in a way that nothing else is really funny. Um, It's definitely, it's definitely intellectual 
Um, it's definitely not intellectual enough to take itself seriously. And it just, there's a certain love about it, um, love of life, love of the different uh, cultural things that they parody and reference. Um, it's just, it's just got so many laughs a minute. It has more laughs a minute than almost anything else I've ever seen. And it's such an off kilter, weird um, especially all the things that go on with Abed. The whole thing with, with Britta and with Shirley, uh, with certain of the characters, there's there's whole realms of humor there that are more applicable in the mainstream. But I feel like the character of Abed and the, and the, and the, the humor that's involved with him is like is a complete ace up the show's sleeve. It changes everything. It turns the whole show on its head and it, it leads to places that are completely unexpected. And if, if humor is an expression of the unexpected, then I think... Abed may be one of the most successful comic devices in any show I can recall seeing, to be honest. <laughs> I, I very much agree with you. Uh, that character embodies a way of seeing the world that is not fairly represented most of the time in media. He's a consummate introvert. He's definitely weirder than the average introvert, but um, that is um, an intensely introverted way of looking at the world that Jeff definitely doesn't have. In fact, I feel like as the show goes on, Jeff becomes more of the straight man and sort of the normal person um, to whom all of these insane people are Absolutely. Uh, are connected. He's he's very much the simple one. He's the the one that is is not very complicated. I, I mean, well, that's not fair. Jeff is a complicated character, but Jeff sees the world the way that most of us see the world. I think there's a certain I think you could really say this for Rick and Morty as well, because this is another point that just strikes me. There's a certain psychological depth um, of what's going on. He hasn't just thought of how the characters are. He has very specific and uh, delightfully explicit, because these things are often left to critics to figure out. They're not made explicit by the show. Um, sort of analyses uh, psychologically of his of his characters, what makes them vulnerable, what their weaknesses are, but they're not just there. People are called on it, and it gives it a cynical feel. But if you enjoy a cynical sense of humor, it's, I mean, it's really, really good. It, 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 I mean, can you can you say it's cynical in a positive way? Is there a word that is slipping my mind that that, that is cynical in a productive way? I mean, there's definitely a concept. I would think. Um, I actually read extensively about this once about a guy who. It's, he has a website uh, for cynics, and his uh, his whole focus is on was on positive cynicism, and how basically his point was that it's only by looking at reality as it is without sugarcoating it that you have an opportunity to be real um, with reality and to be authentic and to you know to enjoy things as they are rather than how you wish they yeah. were. Um, there definitely is a lot of joy in it. It's definitely not a cynicism that's that's pervasive. It's definitely you wouldn't definitely wouldn't say that it's a a dark show per se. You would say that it it's it's a show about people with a lot of darkness um, trying to find a little bit of light. I think maybe is how you you might put it. In other words, they each have these messed up lives, but in each other and in their friendship, they find a certain a shelter or a certain beauty even within all of the stuff that's messed up about them and in fact i think you could even say that's the function of abed abed has a perfect life he's not upset about anything when people are rude to him or call him weird it doesn't affect him whatsoever he's completely above the fray he's completely above everything that makes everyone else cyn- cynical um and the biggest joke of all is that he's a, like a complete looney tune like he's he's totally not normal and we have a lot of trouble relating to his to his point of view um, which may be what the show is trying to say that that on the contrary if you see if you find yourself like not upset if you find yourself cut off um there could be a lot of other things that make you um, less human or less connected to the world, um, which is why you're happy. Um, if anybody is looking at the situation as it is realistically, then you have to take the good with the bad. Otherwise, you end up like Abed. I mean, is ending up like Abed a bad thing? Not necessarily. I do like that they have took some pain starting in the third season to show that being Abed's friend wasn't all fun at games, that, uh, that there are some harm to the way that he views the world and the way that he is. I think I think that much is is should be should be patently obvious to anyone with a little bit of common sense. Clearly, it's not an an ideal to be aimed for, uh, but there definitely are aspects of of uh, of what he does uh, that that for sure to be emulated. Like I said before, I think the danger is that he's 
on the one hand, you could say he's in touch with a deeper reality than everyone else. He's in touch with what's with what's really, really going on behind everything. But again, it's the show with a winking eye. The show is using a winking eye. He's more in touch with everything because he has an intense and incredible knowledge of pop culture and television. And that's why he knows more about the world. And it's hard for me to imagine that the show, on, that the producers of the show honestly think that that's true. That a, uh, that, that a person who's completely immersed in television and sees the world as a TV show will actually be in touch with reality more than the people that view it normally. I think what goes through the producer's mind is, wouldn't it be hilarious if the most in-touch person who actually knows what's going on and is and is uh, and is not bothered by anything and you know and could be the modern-day Jesus in that in that uh, in that one um, very memorable episode, and he has all these incredible like personal powers, and all of that comes through him being totally and utterly immersed in just the cultural driftwood of our of our time. I think it's hilarious. I, I think also the the interesting point that you stumbled on there is that you know he he has all this understanding of TV and whatnot, and of course in real life it doesn't really help him understand the world, but in his world it does because his world is a TV world. Right, which brings us to the next point, which is that they take meta humor in Community to a whole new level. Especially with the whole alternate universe thing, which it still blows my mind that there was actually a network TV show that that there was a network that was willing to have that. I mean, you cancel Firefly, but you let them make those episodes. Uh, just <laughs> astonishing. Well, it wasn't the same people. Uh, also, they did fire him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, after that season where he created the, the alternate universe. Um... So maybe it didn't fly so easily. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, what a great device. And and I mean, I just don't know of any other show that that would do something so bold in a in sort of a meta story and a meta humor type of way. And the best thing about it is that when you see it at first, you're like, oh, that's cute. That's a cute thing to have in one episode. And then it ends up being like this huge storyline. Yeah, which unfortunately comes to a abysmally unpleasant conclusion at the end of the fourth season. But uh, what are you going to do? Oh, does it? Yes. Uh, are, are you familiar with the fourth season? You, you haven't watched it, but are you familiar with it? No. No, I don't know anything about it. It's the year without Dan Harmon. Right. It is the year that Dan Harmon's television show was produced by other people mm-hmm. who I think don't get enough credit. Mm-hmm. I think that it's a pretty decent season of a TV show. But it absolutely is not the it's 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 it has nothing on any of the other five seasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it does eventually come to a head. What very possibly was going to be the series finale, the final episode of Community ever being entirely a dream sequence in Jeff's head where they have to fight the, the evil versions of themselves. Oh, in a a paintball game with multi-dimensional paintballs that pop you out of existence. Well, well, first of all, let me let me say a word for the paintball episodes that I have seen in that they are tremendous and amazing. Yes. And um and I love that they never um are never too caught up with with legitimizing why this is happening it's they're 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 almost completely happy with just saying we have an awesome paintball shootout episode every season deal with it like (laughs) we're not gonna legitimize why this happens except so that we can we can make more jokes about the dean than we have already oh such good memories now coming up now that you now that you've mentioned it there's just so many elements that they get right. Uh, it, it must ju- it must just be that they have a really good quality writing team. I would assume that that's where it all sort of starts. But I mean, you just have so much. It just doesn't end. They created enough funny things in like the first half season that they could keep going for 12 more seasons if they weren't as devoted to doing new things and trying out new creative uh, creative uh, exploration if 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 it's if the first season is all about establishing the characters and establishing things that you could riff on later they would have so much if they were willing to riff more and it's true that they do riff a lot but i mean you could the character of senor chang is just <laughs> infinitely amusing the character of of the of the dean and the and the and the puns and all of these things just just fantastic i mean there's it's just gold it really is 
it's a phenomenal fucking show. True. People should watch it. <laughs> you should finish watching it. Even with uh, the fourth season. I would say suffer through the fourth season because it's not that much suffering. And one of the great tragedies of Community is that after season three, they never got a full season again. That is sad. They have season four, five, and six, but every season is a half season of 13 mm-hmm. episodes, I think, which is a fucking tragedy, particularly given the uh, sixth season need to introduce a bunch more characters after a bunch of the cast left, and thus not really having a sufficient number of episodes to explore those new characters and give them depth. But, all of that being said, every challenge that the show ever faced was handled phenomenally. Even season four is not horrid, despite its many vast multitude of flaws. It's certainly better than a lot of other things that I've sat through on TV. Okay. Uh, And season five has some gold, and season six is possibly one of the best Mm. seasons. That's amazing. How, How do you think we did... I think we did good. I think the uh, first section was a lot longer than the second section when we talked about community, but I might be wrong. Maybe that was just my impression. I don't like. I felt like the community segment. Like I, I feel like I I fucked it up. No, not necessarily. I don't know. I feel like I didn't have anything interesting to say. There's certainly a lot more you need to say, and we can revisit it. I think we need more, maybe a more constructive prompt. Yeah, I I was gonna say the same thing. Like going in, going in, we know like like we know what's interesting, what specific interesting thing we're talking about, and what the angle is. And as we've seen, we as we've seen today, this was a good learning experience for us. Um, we have no problem being discursive. You know, we can go all over the place. We we won't have to stick with that one thing. And certainly, you know, we'll have other ideas and other things to talk about. Absolutely. Um, based on that idea, but to start with, we need like a solid specific proposal i don't think just have knowing that we're going to in general talk about a tv show or a movie yeah um will will really work uh, except for very general comments uh i think you're absolutely that's that's literally what i was going to suggest i think when i wrote down community i was thinking uh because this is something i often do as a writer is that i sit down and do a media analysis i mm-hmm. you know i'm like okay i just watched this movie here are all the things i think about it Um, and I guess in my head, it would come naturally in this format as well, but I guess like like I fucked up because this is a conversation. This is not a, uh, this is not Nick listing all the things that he thinks about community that are interesting. This is Nick and Kellogg talking about community. So something more like a more interesting prompt perhaps would have been, Mm is the third season bad? Because that's a, a big controversy in community is that right. uh, the, the, everyone says that the second season, that's that's the true essence of community. That's what community should have always been striving for is the second season. And that the first, or the, and that the third season was a huge downhill slide, uh, which is something I completely disagree with. And that's something we could have had a conversation about. I disagree. <laughs> 